We are back in Matthew chapter 8, and we're going to pick up uh, in verse 28 this morning. But if, just a reminder quickly that Matthew is, wants us to see that, that Jesus is the king. He's not a king, he's the king. He's the one who's come to put things back in order after Genesis chapter 3. He's the king who's come to establish the kingdom. And that's one reason I've continued to go back to Colossians 1 and then verses 16 through 20. I want to read again this morning. But for by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Amen. He is the head of the body of the church. He's the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on heaven or or rather on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. And so the one who's going to establish the kingdom of God, he's going to have to be able to correct everything, to reconcile all things to himself. He's going to have to be able to do away with illness and disease. And we've seen that, right? Jesus has done that in chapter 8. He's uh, dealt with the leper and the centurion's servant and Peter's mother-in-law. He's also going to have to be able to take care of the natural, right? To, to be able to rule over creation. And we've seen that. Talked about that last week with the storm and the wind and the waves. And he's also going to have to be able to conquer and rule over the supernatural, the demons and the forces of darkness. And we're going to read of that this morning yeah. in Matthew 8. Verses 28 through 34. And so if you're able this morning, if you would, out of reverence for the reading of the word of God, if you stand and Matthew 8, 28 through 34 is our passage this morning. It says, and when he came to the other side, to the country of the Gadarenes, two demon possessed men met him coming out of the tombs so fierce that no one could pass that way. And behold, they cried out, What have you to do with us, O Son of God? Have you come here to torment us before the time? Now a herd of many pigs was feeding at some distance from them, and the demons begged him, saying, If you cast us out, send us away into the herd of pigs. And he said to them, Go. So they came out and went to the pigs, and behold, the whole herd rushed down the steep bank into the sea and drowned in the waters. The herdsmen fled and going into the city, they told everything, especially what had happened to the demon-possessed men. And behold, all the city came out to meet Jesus. And when they saw him, they begged him to leave their region. Let's pray. Dear God, again we come before you. Thanking you for who you are and uh, so thankful for your son and your spirit, Lord, and the authority that, that you have over all creation, whether in heaven or on the earth. And Lord, just pray that this morning, as uh, through the reading and preaching of your word, that we would seek to understand it and that you'd give clarity. But Lord, also that you'd give conviction where needed and courage where needed. And applying the truth of your word to our hearts and minds and our lives. And we pray these things in your son's name. Amen. Amen. And you may be seated. And so, we've talked quite a bit through the study of Matthew. Together we've seen over and over again that the deity of Christ, right, that he is God, he's the Messiah, and it is put on display that he has the authority of the king of the universe and creation. And one major point that Matthew has made beyond the shadow of a doubt is that Jesus is the promised Messiah. And one thing that proves that undeniably is that he has authority over the demons, over the supernatural, over the forces of darkness. If Christ is going to be able to redeem creation, 
then he has to be able to overpower the current ruler of this world or the spirit of the age, the forces of darkness that are working in the culture and world today. He has to be over, able to overpower Satan and the demons yeah. and to take control and to set all things right. Yeah. And so repeatedly through the gospel accounts, we see the writers giving us examples and even into acts of the authority of God over the supernatural, over the demons. Yeah. We saw a few past, a few chapter verses back in chapter eight that he was they were bringing people to him and he was healing them and even casting out demons and evil spirits with the word. That authority is on display. We've seen in Matthew four earlier in our study that when Satan tempted Jesus, that Jesus was able to resist Satan, and that's important that he can resist Satan and the forces of darkness. <laughs> But his deity, his authority, his power goes way beyond that. Not only is it important that he can resist them, but as we'll see in our passage today and we see all throughout the New Testament, is that they cannot resist him. He doesn't give in to what they say, but they have to do what he says. They have to obey him. They can't, they can't resist Jesus. They have to submit to him. Okay. And if you... Remember this, it's been a little bit, but on Sunday nights we're going through 1 John together. And in 1 John chapter 3, uh, it says in there that the reason that the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. That he came, one of those purposes was to destroy the works of the devil. He's coming to the world, he's going to do that. Ultimately, that's going to happen when he establishes his kingdom. He's going to bind Satan and the demons. They're going to be thrown into the pit. They're going to be uh, bound for a thousand years while Jesus reigns on the earth. And at the end of that, they're going to be cast into the lake of fire. Ultimately, he's going to destroy the works of the devil forever. Uh, but we see in his casting out of demons through his earthly ministry that he has the power to do it and the authority to do it. And he's showing that through that miracle of commanding and casting out demons. And we discussed this a little bit back in Matthew 7, the idea of casting out demons, uh, because there was those who came to Jesus and said, Lord, Lord, didn't we do this and didn't we do that? And Jesus says, I never knew you. And one of the things they claimed to have been able to do was cast out demons in his name. Uh, but but I, we've talked about this a little bit, but just to remind you, this is not an easy thing to do. Uh, this was not an easy thing to do. And it's an important thing that Jesus does it because in Matthew 12, we also looked at when we were in Matthew 7, Jesus said when they were questioning him about casting out demons, Matthew 12, 28, he says, but if it's by the Spirit of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. And that's a big deal, right? Jesus said one of the marks of the coming of the kingdom of God was that he was going to be casting out demons. He said, if I'm casting out demons by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Yeah. And it certainly had. That was the message of his ministry that we saw in chapter 4, verse 17 of Matthew 4. From that time, Jesus began to preach, saying, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Yeah. And so his ability to command and cast out demons is evidence that he is God in the flesh, right? That he's divine. That the kingdom of God is at hand. And that's what he was preaching. The kingdom of God's at hand. You need to repent. What's one of the evidences of that? That he is able to command and cast out demons. And so we're going to get into that today and see that happen. But before we do, again, we need to remind ourselves, even though we've talked about this in some previous weeks, that casting out demons is not an easy thing to do. Right? It wasn't an easy thing to do. Uh, the, the 12, the disciples, when they're commissioned as apostles, Jesus says they have the authority to do that. But in chapter 17 of Matthew, even though they have the authority to do it, they basically come back and say, hey, this, we're having a hard time. They're not, the demons aren't cooperating. Right? They're not listening to us. This is not an easy thing to do. We looked at Acts 19 previously with the seven sons of Sceva, in Acts 19, we see about these the Jewish exorcists that had their ceremonies where they would try to cast out demons. 
Acts 19, 13 through 16, it talks about the sons of Sceva, of a, the seven sons of a Jewish high priest. Uh, they were trying to cast out demons. And they said that they adjure you, they said to the demon, I adjure you by the Jesus whom Paul proclaims. But the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are you? And the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them, mastered all of them, overpowered them, and they fled out of the house naked and wounded. So it's not easy. Now, this isn't one of those things that like Jesus cast out demons and everyone's like, well, that's not a big deal. People do that all the time. Right? This was a major deal. It's not easy to do. And so uh, in Mark 1, 27 and 28, Jesus has cast out a demon uh, and it says the people were amazed. Verse 27 of Mark 1, they were amazed so that they questioned among themselves, saying, what is this? A new teaching with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits and they obey him. Amen. And at once his fame spread everywhere throughout the surrounding region of Galilee. Why were they amazed? Why were his fame spreading? Because the demons obeyed him. Right? It wasn't an easy thing to do. They didn't cooperate with everybody. But when Jesus is doing it, they cooperate. People are amazed. And so this morning we come to this passage in Matthew 8, starting on verse 28. And, and they've crossed the Sea of Galilee, this large lake. They've crossed that. They've, uh, there's some other boats following. Remember, Mark says there were others following in other boats. They've been following Jesus across the lake. In the middle of the lake, there's this raging, violent, vicious storm that they sail into that we talked about last week. They all start to say, we're going to die. Basically, Jesus wakes up from a nap and tells the storm to hush. And immediately, the storm responds. And the winds immediately are calm and the water is calm. And so they come to the other side now and they step out of the boats and they are in another very serious and an intense situation. I have a feeling the people in the boats, they just thought they were going to die in the storm, and they're thinking, well, I'm glad that's over. Jesus handled that. You know, that could have got bad. And then they pull up on the banks on the other side of this lake, and these two demon possessed men come running out of this graveyard, screaming and hollering. And they probably thought, out of the frying pan and into the fire, right? And so here's what happens. This intense situation, Matthew 8, 28, says, When he came to the other side, to the country of the Gadarenes, two demon-possessed men met him, coming out of the tombs so fierce that no one could pass that way. No one could pass that way. And so I do have a quick side note I want to point out just for because the opportunity presents itself. Matthew says the region of the Gadarenes. Mark and Luke write the Gerasenes. And so maybe it doesn't matter to you that they use different words, but it's an opportunity to clear up uh, kind of a uh, myth that there's a contradiction here. And so the reason that they say different things is there's a village off the Sea of Galilee on that side named Gergesa, right? And it had some cliffs. It was right at the edge of the sea. Uh, likely this is where the pigs were that ran off the cliff but that's the village the larger city there was called Gadara and so Matthew says the region of the Gadarenes because that's the major city and Gergesa or why, why Matthew, or Mark and Luke say the Gerasenes that's the village right, it's the same region but two of them specify the village this is likely occurring in and Matthew's talking about this larger region of the Gadarenes. And that shouldn't be a very confusing thing for us because where we live over in this part of the world is kind of like a geographical anomaly to some degree, right? Because most of us would say we live in Glen Rose. But your mailing address isn't Glen Rose. It's either Traskwood or Malvern or, or Benton, right? But we live in Glen Rose, but we don't live in Glen Rose. And so we say Glen Rose because that's kind of the village, if you will. But we're all connected to a larger area, right? Malvern, Benton, or somewhere that's incorporated. And so that's all that's going on there. It's not a contradiction. They just are specifying different parts of the region. Mark and Luke say the specific village, and Matthew's referring to the larger uh, 
area. Another thing, it says that two demon-possessed men met him. And again, Mark and Luke only mention one. But Mark and Luke mention the one that Jesus has the conversation with, who says, we're legion for we're many. And again, neither of them say there was only one. If you read Mark and Luke's account, and we're going to look at that together today, but you'll see that they even specify the one who had the legion. So they don't even leave out, they don't even say there wasn't two. They just really focus in on the one who kind of takes the show uh, in their accounts, the, their record of it. So there's obviously two of them, but Mark and Luke focus in on Legion for their purposes and writing to their audiences. So don't let those seeming contradictions be a problem, okay? I just, I know maybe it doesn't matter to you, but that was a, something I, I don't want to overlook so we can clear up any uh, of the myths out there about contradictions in Scripture. So, what's it say? There's two demon-possessed men that met him coming out of the tomb, so fierce that no one could pass that way. So, something that's kind of an elephant in the room today in a lot of Christian circles is, what does that mean? What is demon possession? When it says demon-possessed men, what is it talking about? Uh, but beyond that, what can demons do, right? Can, can demons only possess people or can they do other things to people? And so there's a lot of things we see in Scripture that demons can do. But they can tempt. They can cause illness and disease. Paul said that his disorder, the thorn in his flesh, he called it a messenger from Satan sent to harass him. And so demons can affect and do a lot of different things. They can have a, a physical attack, a spiritual attack, a mental attack. Uh, the, the Bible says that uh, it talks a lot about the doctrines of demons, the teachings of demons, the perversions of the truth, uh, uh, these teachings from demons that lead people into all kinds of error and idolatry and paganism. Demons we see physically attack people. They make people mute. They make people blind. They can cause other issues like ep epilepsy and other physical issues. We see that in Scripture. We see that they can attack the minds of people uh, they, they can bring insanity like these men here in Gadara. Uh, and, and Mark chapter 9 talks about a, a boy who was demon possessed who continually tried to take his own life. Right? The demon would cause him to throw himself into the water to drown himself or would throw himself into the fire to burn himself up. So they can attack mentally. They can cause insanity and, and, and mental uh, issues there. In Mark 5, it says that these men were harming themselves, cutting themselves with rocks. In Revelation, we see that demons can cause people to murder. So there's a physical attack on the body, but there's the mind that demons can influence and attack. They have a spiritual attack. There's spiritual war that they engage in. They twist the truth. They bring about false religions and occult practices. And they spread lies. And, and we see through scripture, right? And I'll, I'll give you the passage in just a moment. But wherever there's a pagan religion, wherever there's false religion, any kind of paganism, there is demonic influence or control. There's demonic power in every pagan and false religion. The Bible says all of the gods of the pagans, all of the gods of the heathens are idols, which in the Hebrew and the Greek that... Uh, that's demons. All the gods of the pagans are demons. Psalm 96 5. All the gods of the pagans are worthless idols. And, and we think of idols and we say, oh, well, that just means they're not real. No, the, the word in Hebrew is El Elim, which means false gods, uh, a demon, some kind of spiritual power. El Elim in Psalm 96 there. All the gods of the pagans are demons. The Greek Old Testament, the Septuagint, translates it that way, that all the gods of the pagans are demons. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10.20 that all pagan sacrifices are offered to demons, not God. And he warns the Corinthians not to be partakers, not to be involved with demons, that all the sacrifices of the pagans are offered to demons. And so demons can do a lot of things, and we don't talk about that a lot today, and I think there's a lot of reasons for that. But it's important for us to talk about because we're going to see, we see in this passage how much influence, how much uh, demons and darkness can influence an area or a culture. And so this is intentional. This is real stuff. It's important. I'm not just chasing rabbits. This is a, 
a major deal. We talked about it while we were in Matthew 7 with those men who claimed to cast out demons, how uh, this is still happening. This isn't fairy tales. It's not make-believe. Uh, there's demonic power. We talked about the magicians of Pharaoh and how they were able to make their staffs turn into snakes too. Where did that power come from? Mm -hmm. it came from somewhere. On Wednesday night after that, we kind of got into that discussion and the prophets of Baal and, and all of these other things and, and, and how the Bible talks about and prohibits and uh, uh, condemns witchcraft and sorcery and divination and necromancy and astrology. And why does God prohibit those things? Because they're not real or because they are real and because they're demonic. And so there's a lot of things going on with demons that's still taking place today. It goes all the way through Revelation. It's not fake. It's not imaginary. It's prohibited because it's real and it's demonic and paganism is enveloped in that. And look at these men in this passage, right? The demon possessed in scripture. They have super strength, right? Superhuman strength. Does that sound like any pagan gods you've ever heard of? Sounds like all of them. Right? Sounds like all of them. Says that they cut their flesh and they're mutilating their bodies. Does that sound like anything that goes on in paganism all the time? Psalm 96 says all the gods of the pagans are demons. Paul says all pagan sacrifices are offered to demons in 1 Corinthians 10. Paganism and all false religions are enveloped in, and demons are involved there. They're influencing that. They twist the truth. They're able to perform mighty works. They lead people astray. Uh, they can appear as heavenly messengers, angels of light, right? But the Bible's clear that it's demonic. They're demons. So they can do all kinds of things. Demon possession is just one of those things. And these men here are possessed. To demon possessed men and demon possession the best definition I could give you that I could find for this that was clear was that demon possession is when demons inhabit the body of a person and control that person to varying degrees and we see that throughout the New Testament all the way into Revelation so it's not gone away it's still uh, around and it's not going to go away until Jesus handles it once and for all and binds them and casts them out into that pit and here we see that he has the power and authority to do that so verse 28 Matthew 8 two demon possessed men met him coming out of the tomb so fierce that no one could pass that way I want you to understand the power the severity of demonic influence and demonic possession and so I want to look at the other two accounts from Luke 8 and Mark 5 this same instance where they get to the shore and here come these men Luke 8, 27 through 29 says, They sailed to the country of the Gerasenes, which is opposite Galilee. And when Jesus stepped out on the land, there met him a man from the city who had demons. For a long time he had worn no clothes. He had not lived in a house but among the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell down before him and said with a loud voice, What have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I beg you, do not torment me. For he commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. For many a time it had seized him. He was kept under guard and bound with chains and shackles, but he would break the bonds and be driven, driven by the demon into the desert or the wilderness. Superhuman strength. Mark 5, 1 through 7. They came to the other side of the sea, the country of the Gerasenes, and when Jesus had stepped out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit. He lived among the tombs, and no one could bind him, not even with a chain, for he had often broken, or he had often been bound with shackles and chains, but he wrenched the chains apart, and he broke the shackles in pieces. No one had the strength to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and on the mountains, he was always crying out and cutting himself with stones. And when he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and fell down before him. And crying out with a loud voice, he said, What have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I adjure you by God, do not torment me. And so we put these three accounts together from Matthew 8 and from Mark and Luke. And we see that these guys lived out among the tombs in this rocky region on these cliffs. They would have carved 
the tombs into the edges of the rock, and that's where these guys are living. They, they, they're not able to live in town with people. They're, they're so uh, uh, violent and fierce. It says that they're cutting themselves and gashing at their flesh with stones. They can't be bound with chains or shackles. They have superhuman strength. They're mutilating their own flesh. It says that uh, day and night, right, they were screaming, crying out on the mountain. And the Greek word there means to be shrieking. There is incoherent shrieking. They're cutting themselves, they're mutilating themselves, they're shrieking all the time. Uh, I mean, they're naked, they're beating themselves up. Uh, I want you to picture this scene that they've pulled up on. They've just come out of the storm and thought, whoo! And this is what they pull up to. Superhuman strength. It says they were so fierce in Matthew's account, they came out of the tombs so fierce that no one would pass by that way. The idea is that when anybody got close to the graveyard, these guys would come out of the tombs and come running, screaming down the hill to do who knows what to the people that were getting close. And so people didn't go. They were afraid of these guys. They were so violent and fierce and, and, and strong and fast. And they shrieked, screaming and yelling, cutting themselves. Right? Picture that. Naked, cut up, superhuman strength, running down the hill, screaming and shrieking. No wonder nobody passed by that way, right? No wonder nobody went over there. But here in Matthew 8, they pull up, and this time it's different. This time they see the boats pull up. They come running down the hill towards the shore and to do their demon thing, right? But this time they see that it's Jesus, and it's different. Verse 29, Behold, they cried out, What have you to do with us, O Son of God? The other account said when they saw it was Jesus. So they come out, they see who it is, and so this time the response is different. Have you come here to torment us before the time? Mark said when he saw Jesus from afar, he fell down before him, crying out with a loud voice. So it says when he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and fell down before him. That's what Mark said. This is different. They run out. There's people on the shore, but this time it's Jesus. And Mark said that they fell down before him. The word Mark uses in Greek is the word proskuneo, which means to fall prostrate before someone. It's the word that Jesus uses for worship in John chapter 4 when he says that the Father is looking for those who will worship him. It's proskuneo. It means to fall down, to worship. It's the idea of kissing the hand of a sovereign or to bend the knee. Right? It's about reverence and respect. And that's the word it says these demons did. They came and they bent their knee before Christ. Amen. They fell down before him. They bowed their knee to him. Why would the demons come to worship him? Why would the New Testament use that word? Because the demons know who they're dealing with. Right. They know exactly who he is. They know exactly who's standing there. Nobody had to tell them, right? No, they didn't need help with their theology. Their Christology, what they believe about Jesus, was spot on. And when they see it's him, proscuneo, prostrate themselves, they fall down, they bend the knee before him. It's different from what we saw last week, right? All these people following Jesus. And the storm comes, and, and they start to question who Jesus is. These disciples, these learners under Jesus, they question him. Jesus, we're dying here. Don't you care? Can't you do anything about this? After he stops the storm, what do they say? What kind of man is this that even the winds and the waves obey him? The people following him had questions about who he was. But when the demons seen, they know exactly who he is. Amen. They don't question it. They fall down before him. And behold, they cried out. What have you to do with us, O Son of God? Mark and Luke say, Son of the Most High God. They know who He is when He shows up. They say, have you come here to torment us before the time? That's significant, right? Not only is their Christology correct, their eschatology, what they believe about the end times, is biblically sound. They say, have you come to torment us before the time? They know who He is. Are you here to do this earlier than expected? They know that he's the judge of the universe. They know he's the one who's going to pass judgment on them. 
They know he's the one who's going to condemn them to be bound and cast into the lake of fire. And, and they say, if you come to do this earlier than expected, John MacArthur said the demons were premillennialists. <laughs> right? They, they knew that they were going to be bound during the millennial reign. And basically they said, hey, it's not time yet. Why are you here? It's not time yet. Are you here to torment us? What do they say? Before the time. They knew who he was. They knew that they were condemned for all eternity. They knew that he's the one who would judge them and condemn them. And they fall down and they worship him because they know who he is. They recognize his power and his authority. And they can't help but submit to it. The interesting thing is these demons here, that, that idea of falling down, bending the knee, submitting to his authority, and, and, and saying before the time, they're better theologians than most people. Right? They had better theology than a lot of self-professed Christians today. There's a lot of religious leaders, there's a lot of cults, there's a lot of uh, people out there that they don't recognize the authority of Christ like these demons. They don't submit to his authority. They don't fall down before him. But these demons did, and one day everybody's going to, right? That's what Paul writes in Philippians 2, verses 9 through 11. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. These demons bow their knee when they see Christ. They fall down before him. What did James say? That even the demons believe and do what? The demons believe and tremble. That's what James said. Even the demons believe and tremble. Why? Because they know who they're dealing with. They know who he is. They recognize his power. And that's what Matthew wants us to see. That he's God. That he's the king. That he has authority over all creation. Both the natural and the supernatural. Amen. That's the kind of power that Jesus has. And when all these other people we've read about in, the last, uh, in this chapter. Don't you care? Are you able to do anything about this? What kind of man is this? That even the wind and waves obey him. But the demons fall down. And say, oh, son of God. Mm -hmm. They know who he is and they submit to that. And we see that because look at verse 30. Now a herd of many pigs was feeding at some distance from them. And the demons begged him saying, if you cast us out, send us away into that herd of pigs. And he said to them, go. So they came out into the pigs and behold, the whole herd rushed down the steep bank into the sea and drowned in the waters. Listen, here's the deal. The demons have to ask him for permission. They make a request. It says they begged him. The demons ask him for his permission. They don't want to leave the area. They don't want to be cast into the pit yet. They don't want to be bound. But they'd like to stay in the region. So they say, hey, we know you're going to send us out. If you're going to cast us out, they know it's coming, right? But if you're going to do that, please, they begged him, and he sent us into those pigs over there. And so, listen, I'm not going to make a big deal out of the pigs and the demons going into the pigs, and there's a lot of theories out there, and you maybe heard people preach this and try to make a big deal out of the pigs, but the Bible doesn't tell us that much about the pigs. We can gather that Gadara from other things is a mostly pagan or Gentile region. It's under Gentile control. One way is they're raising pigs, so they're not Jewish, but there's not a lot there, so I'm not going to speculate a lot about the pigs because the focus of the passage isn't the demons and the pigs and how all that works. The focus of the passage is the authority that Jesus has over the demons. That's the emphasis. So they say, cast us out. They know who he is. They know it's inevitable. They know his authority. If you're going to do it, will you cast us into the pigs? They ask him for permission. In his response, one word, and he said to them, go. And so think about this, right? We talked about, we talked about the sons of Sceva. We talked about the apostles, how other people had so much trouble getting demons to cooperate. But when Jesus is the one they're dealing with, they want to go. They want, permit, they, they want to cooperate. 
They want to go. They just want to know where they're allowed to go. They want permission. They're not going to overstep. They're not going to go against his authority. They want to cooperate. They fall down before him, begging him, please don't do this. Will you please just let us do that? They want to get away from him as soon as possible. And they want his permission so that they know it's okay. Think about that. Other people had trouble. The sons of Sceva. What did the demon say? We know Jesus and we know Paul. But who are you? But Jesus, O oh Son of the Most High God, please, please just allow us to go to those pigs. And he said to them, Go. They came out and went to the pigs. And behold, the whole herd rushed down the steep bank into the sea and drowned in the waters. He said, Go. From the moment that they got there, the demons wanted to get away. They asked for permission. He said, Go. That's the emphasis of this account. Right? It's not to speculate about the pigs. It's not to speculate about these other things. It's to show the authority of Jesus. We've seen in Matthew 8, he has authority over illness and disease. He has authority over uh, the natural realm. And now he has authority over the supernatural realm. Why? Because Matthew's showing us that he has authority because he's the king. And in case you're wondering if there's anything he doesn't have authority over, Matthew gives us an example from every area. Because as Paul writes in Colossians, he's going to re reconcile all things to himself. Whatever ruler, whatever authority, whatever dominion, he's over all of it, Paul says. And Matthew shows us that here. Listen, demons are powerful. We don't talk about that a lot today. They're powerful. People had trouble with them. Think about uh, in Daniel chapter 10, when the angel comes to Daniel and he says, sorry, I was delayed, but the prince of Persia, who's a demon, had held me up. The demon, the prince of Persia, was powerful enough to stop this angel from coming to Daniel, a messenger from the Lord. The demon could stop him. He was delayed for 21 days, he says in Daniel 10. And the angel wasn't able to get away to come to Daniel until an even badder dude, Michael the archangel, showed up to relieve him. So the prince of Persia was able to overpower this other angel. And then Michael the archangel overpowered the prince of Persia. So demons are powerful. If they can stop an angel from getting to Daniel, there's a lot of power in that. But then even though Michael overpowered that demon, Jude writes that Satan himself and Michael, the archangel, were arguing over the body of Moses. And neither one of them overpowered the other. Jude says it was a stalemate. Michael's bad enough to stop the prince of Persia, but when it comes to Satan, Michael, the archangel, and Satan, it's a stalemate, and God had to handle it. They said, this is a stalemate. Let's let God decide. And Michael and Satan in Jude's account submit to the authority of God but I point that out because demons are powerful we see it in Daniel 10 we see it in Jude we see it with the magicians of Pharaoh we see it with the prophets of Baal we see it with the witch of Endor in the Old Testament we see it all over the place they're so powerful that, uh, that, that they can interfere with angels and things of that nature but when there's a contest between Satan and Michael, who do they defer to? God's authority. And that's the authority Jesus has. Yeah. That's the authority Jesus has here. As powerful as demons are, as much as they can do in the natural world and supernatural world, they submit to his authority. Only the Lord could command Satan when he argued with Michael. Only the Lord could tell him what he was allowed and not allowed to do to Job. Only the Lord could crush the head of the snake. And only the Lord could say to the demons, go, and they're gone. And that's what we see Jesus do because that's who he is. He's God. And that's what Matthew's showing us, that this is the God uh, of Israel. This is him in the flesh, the Messiah, the King. Look what happens after this happens. Imagine seeing all that happen, by the way. These guys that no one else could stop, that no one else could find, that everyone else is afraid of, and Jesus doesn't flinch. They run down the mountain at him, and he doesn't flinch, and they fall down in front of him. 
And he says, go. And they leave. They screamed and chased everybody else off, but they fall down before him and say, Jesus, Son of God, please, please don't torment us. They're afraid of him. Everyone else is afraid of them, and they're afraid of him. Imagine seeing that. And look what happened. Verses 33 through 34, the herdsmen fled, and going into the city, they told everything, especially what had happened to the demon-possessed men. And behold, all the city came out to meet Jesus. That's what you think would happen, right? You hear about those guys that everyone's scared of, and you say, i got to go meet this guy for myself. But they all come out to see Jesus, but look what happens. And when they saw him, verse 34, they begged him to leave their region. Mark says in verses 14 through 17 of Mark 5, his account, the herdsmen fled, they told the city and the country, all the people came out to see what had happened. And they came to Jesus and saw the demon-possessed man, the one who had the legion, sitting there, clothed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. Those who had seen it described to them what had happened to the demon-possessed man and to the pigs. And they began to beg Jesus to depart from their region. All of the city came out to meet Jesus, Matthew says. Mark says they all came out to see. They all saw these men sitting there in their right mind. They're cured. And what are they afraid of? Jesus. And they started to beg him to leave their region. The whole city hears what happened. They hear about this encounter with Jesus. They all come out. That happened to other places, right? The woman at the well, she goes back and tells everybody in her village what, about her encounter with Jesus. And they all come out, but they all get saved. When they come out after the Samaritan woman shares her story, these people go share their story. And again, the whole town comes out. And But it's different this time because they beg Jesus to leave. And I know, again, people want to speculate about the pigs and say, well, they were mad about the pigs. But I don't think that's why they're mad. That's not what it says, right? Mark said, they came to Jesus, and when they saw the demon-possessed man, the one who had had legion, over 2,000 demons in him, sitting there, clothed in his right mind, they were afraid. They're upset about the pigs. They're afraid of what Jesus can do to those demons. They've been possessed. You couldn't bind them. They were naked. They were shrieking. They were cutting themselves. They were crazy, perverted, dark, evil, twisted men. And when they saw them with their clothes on in their right mind, they were afraid. And they began to ask Jesus to leave their region. Think about this, all right? The demons didn't want to leave the area. They said, hey, just let us go into the pigs. Because no doubt, this area of the Gadarenes is 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 rampant with darkness and demonic influence. They're well established there. Over 2,000 in this one man uh, who says we're a legion for we're many. The demons are established there. This region, these people, they're immersed in darkness. They're immersed in demonic power and influence and, and, and all that goes with it. But here's the deal. They're comfortable with that. They've learned to live with those guys. We'll stay over here and they can stay out there in the graveyard and you know we can't find them but you know we're done trying as long as they stay over there in their area we're comfortable and we'll live with that we're comfortable with that we can handle that they weren't trying to get rid of them they decided they were content those guys could live outside the city in the tombs and you know they figured out how to live with the darkness they knew how to work with that what were they not comfortable with what were they not willing to work with what were they not willing to tolerate? And that was the light. They, they, they learned how to tolerate and work with the darkness. They could handle that. But when the light shows up on their shores, they ask him to leave. They beg him to leave. Why? Well, John 3, 19 through 20, it's not about the pigs. It's about the light and the darkness. John 3, 19 through 20 says, this, Jesus said, this is the judgment. The light has come into the world and people loved the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. Think about it. The people in that area, they're more afraid of Jesus than these demon-possessed men. 
they had figured out how to live with Satan uh, influencing their region, but they wanted the Savior to leave. They begged Jesus to leave. And we live in a culture today, I think, that's very much like that. A culture that's full of people ready, running as fast as they can away from the light, running straight into the darkness. I, I hope they don't realize what they're running to, but they're still running to it. They, they, they're running as quick as they can away from the, the light and further and further into the darkness. And when it comes to demon possession and demon power and influence, I, you know, I have a lot more questions about that usually than I do answers, but I do know this. The New Testament's full of it. It's everywhere Jesus went. It's in Israel. The rest of the region, like this region here, Gentile regions, are, were infested with it. Demonic forces and darkness. And it's still around today. It's a very real thing. And, and we've almost got to where we try to overlook it or down talk it, down play. People say, well, it's just, you know, that's not demon. That's not demonic. That's just drugs. It's not demonic. That's not real. That stuff doesn't happen anymore. But the New Testament says that it does. And by the way, side note here, the New Testament word for sorcery, which is associated with demonic activity and forbidden in the New Testament, is the Greek word pharmakeia, which is where we get the English word pharmacy. And in the Greek, it refers to mind-altering drugs, particularly those used in occult practices, witchcraft, and magic, used to enter a psychedelic spiritual state in order to communicate with spirits, to spirit walk, or to talk to the divine. And so that's just a side note, right? But you say, well, it's drugs. Well, in the Old Testament, the Greek word for sorcery, which is demonic, is the word pharmakeia, which is where we get the word pharmacy. So Satan's been involved in the drug scene for quite some time. But those things, sorcery, witchcraft, paganism, divination, necromancy, all of that, it's not, it's not prohibited because it's fake or it's not real. It's prohibited because it is real. And it's demonic. But we live in a culture that's kind of comfortable with the darkness, but we don't like the light, right? People are afraid of God's word so much so that there are school districts in our culture that don't allow uh, teachers to carry the Bible because they don't want the students exposed to that. Or there are coaches, public school coaches, who are fired and fighting for their jobs from praying with their team in our country today. We live in a culture where the military thousands and thousands of young people in the military are turning to paganism and rejecting the scripture or hot springs arkansas just down the road has an annual pagan festival we live in a culture remember all the gods of the pagans are demons we live in a culture where it's okay to kill your babies just like the worshipers of molech and it's okay to mutilate your body like these men in our passage and those who worship Baal. and it's okay to do all kinds of sexually immoral things like those who worship Ashtaroth and Ishtar and Aphrodite and Venus. All that's okay in our culture today. That's We're comfortable with that. But when it comes to Jesus, when it comes to the Word of God, that's not welcome. That's dangerous. We don't want to shove that down anyone's throat. That's, that's the light, and we want to beg it to leave our region. When they came to Jesus, they begged him to leave. We live in a culture where even amongst those who claim to believe and follow Jesus, you know, they, we know how to live in a culture of darkness. We know how to work with that. We're comfortable with that. We're used to that. As long as they stay in their lane over in the graveyard and we stay over here, we've, we've kind of become comfortable dealing with and working with and cooperating with the darkness. We know how to function in that culture. Even those who say they're believers. But when it comes to church, when it comes to prayer, when it comes to Bible study, not comfortable with that. Don't need that. That's not that important. And we've kind of convinced ourselves that to just ignore it. You don't hear a lot of preachers or teachers in churches teach and preach on this kind of demonic influence and activity and darkness. There are people, preachers, who probably think I'm a little crazy for talking about it today. There's other people who say I'm crazy for even believing these things, but it's clear in Scripture this is the way that it is. It's darkness. It's influencing things. It's still around. And the idea that if we just don't poke the devil, maybe he'll leave us alone. I don't know if you've noticed, but he doesn't seem to be agreeing to that rule. 
If we don't poke him, maybe he'll leave us alone. But if anything, he's more and more coming after churches, Christian families, Christian homes. He's coming after our children with the darkness and the influence. And like the people of the region of Gadara, I'm afraid that at large we've learned to live with it, ignore it, just leave it over in the graveyard. We can work with the darkness. These people had seen the power and the authority of Jesus. Clearly their area is covered in it. And you think they would say, thank you. Thank you for dealing with those guys. Why don't you stay here? There's a whole bunch more of this going on. Why don't you take care of this for us? Why don't you run all the darkness out for us? Thank you for what you've done. But that's not what they said. They actually said, no thanks, we're good. We don't need that. We don't want that. It's not, no thanks. When they saw him, they begged him to leave their region. I want to close with this. Mark 5, 18 through 20. Just a few thoughts on Mark's account. As he's getting into the boat, the man who had been possessed with legion begged him that he might be with him. So he wants to stay with Jesus. The guy he helped wants to stay with him. He wants to be in the light. But Jesus did not permit him, but said to him, Go home to your friends and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he's had mercy on you. And he went away and began to proclaim in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him. And everyone marveled. The man possessed with legion says, Lord, please let me come with you. And uh, he's, he's done with darkness. He doesn't want to be around that. He's come out of that. And he wants to be as close to the light as he can be. And Jesus says, no, you need to stay here. And very quickly, that's just an example of how you know having peace about something isn't necessarily evidence that that's what God wants us to do. This man has peace about going with Jesus. He wants to get out of there. Jesus said, you need to stay here and talk about the light because the region is immersed in darkness. He goes to, it says, the Decapolis. That's a 10-city region. He's going as much through 10 cities over there telling people what Jesus had done. These are Gentile cities, idolatrous cities, demon infiltrated, covered in darkness. But Jesus says, stay here and tell people what I've done for you. What a testimony that guy had. So I... I had a couple of things I wanted to point out, but for the sake of time, I just want to say this. As believers, I think that what we can see is, well, think of the testimony of this man, right? The, the incredible grace of God, that God could take a madman, a man who was cutting himself and mutilating his body, who was running around naked and shrieking and was just bent on self-destruction. He's miserable and perverse and evil and depraved. And Jesus changed him and saved him and made him a missionary to go tell other people what Jesus had done for him. And so maybe this morning you're lost, you're not saved, you're in the darkness, you're still in your sin, you've never come to Christ by grace alone, through faith alone, you've never placed your faith in him and on him alone for salvation, you've been trusting in all this other stuff, you've been living in sin and in the darkness, and you say, listen, I don't know, I don't know if Jesus can save me, I don't know if the gospel's for me, I don't know if it can happen for me, but listen, Jesus pulled this man out of the depths of darkness and sin. And he can do that for you and he will do that for you right. if you believe and place your faith in him. John 3, 17, Jesus, or 18 rather, John 3, 18. Whoever believes in him is not condemned. Whoever does not believe is condemned because he's not believed in the name of the only Son of God. Right. If Jesus can save this man and bring him to the light, he can do it for you and he wants to do it for you. But believers this morning, you know you're what? You're converted, you're born again, you're blood washed. You have no doubt about that. Well, my question then is, listen, Jesus could have stayed on the other side of that lake with the disciples. They could have had a great time. He could have made more free fish and bread and had a good old time. But instead, knowing there's a storm out there, knowing there was a legion, an army of demons on the other side, knowing that the people over there wouldn't all accept him, because he's God, right? He knew all that. So he could have stayed over there where it was comfortable and had a great time, but he didn't. He decided to sail into the storm to go face an army of darkness on the other side. Yeah. And, and, and knowing the whole time, he still gave the order in verse 18 to go to the other side. He knew they were going to reject him. And so for believers this morning, if you know that you are saved, my question would be this. First of all, our, is our theology worse than that of the demons? 
Are we willing to bend our knee and submit to the authority of Christ in every aspect of our life? But second of all, are we willing to see what Jesus did here and, and start having some difficult, some serious conversations? Start taking the light into the darkness. Be the light of the world that he's called us to be. And just like that, right? They didn't, they were rejecting Jesus. They're not rejecting you. They don't, they're not afraid of you. They, they don't dislike you. Who they asked to leave the region was Jesus. Whoa. They're rejecting Jesus. And so this morning, my encouragement to you as a believer would be, understand this stuff's real. All the gods of the pagans are demons. It's not make-believe. We're in a very serious spiritual battle. Amen. And we need to take it very seriously. As serious as Jesus, that he would tell those people, I'm going to cross, I'm going to sail through a storm to face this army of darkness. Why? Everyone else in the region was going to reject him. But these two men, these two men needed him. Amen. And there's a world of darkness out there. And there are people out there that need the light. And for believers, we need to be taking that light to them, knowing they might reject us, they might hate us, they might badmouth us, but they need the light. Amen. And if you're still in the darkness, you need to come to the light and place your faith in Christ this morning. We're going to pray that we're going to have a moment of invitation. Don't leave here today stained, enveloped, and comfortable with the darkness if you need to come to Christ. Don't leave here today refusing to be obedient to Christ and bend the knee if you know you need to follow him in baptism, if you know you need to become serious about church membership, not forsaking the assembling of yourselves to a body, if the demons can submit to Christ, I pray that believers can too. Amen. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for who you are. Thank you for all you do for us. Thank you for your word that we can see that, that Jesus is. God incarnate, he's the word made flesh, that he's the one who's bringing the kingdom of heaven, the, uh, establishing his kingdom, that he's the one who reconciles all things to himself, all rulers and authorities and dominions, everything on the earth and in heaven and under the earth, Lord, that he is the king of the universe of all creation. And Lord, I pray this morning, if there's anyone that's never trusted in him, they'd submit to who he is and trust in him for salvation today. Lord, I pray for those that are believers that for whatever reason, Lord, they've not been submitting to his authority and his command of them to, to be a, a part of a local body or to follow him in baptism or whatever it may be, God. I pray that you would give conviction where needed and clarity where needed and courage where needed. Lord, that as believers here at Fair Play, that regardless of what other churches are doing and what the culture is doing, that we would be a church that, that's willing to sail with you into a storm to face the forces of darkness and to shine a light so that those who are trapped in it can find their way out to your Son. We pray these things in his holy and precious name. Amen.